Okay, so let's start. Uh, my name is Rahul Verma. I'm a fellow at the Center for Policy Research. We are very pleased to welcome Stefan Shakespeare. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of YouGov. YouGov is a market research agency. They also do a lot of political consultancy and polling in UK and US. And they have recently, or in recent times, they have also started working in India. Uh, YouGov did a very interesting series uh, of, of like two rounds of survey, and they are going to do the third round of survey in partnership with Mint. So from Mint, we have Pramit Bhattacharya, who is a data editor at Mint, and he's one of the pioneers who in some ways started data journalism uh, at Mint, and now uh, many of his students, today's Teacher's Day, right? So many of his students are sort of like heading or working at various newspapers uh, 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 in the data segment. Uh, so what we're going to do today is, uh, Stefan is basically going to use insights from a very uh, interesting survey they did in collaboration with Cambridge University across 23 countries. And I think the big punchline of that survey is that the pro-globalization consensus that was part of the Western world is now moving towards the East, which, me which raises lots of important and interesting questions. Uh, the first one would be that many of us think that spread of globalization also carried some liberal norms. And if this link between the West and pro-globalization consensus is now breaking, what does it mean to, uh, what does it mean to uh, spread of liberal norms? Second, I think, and I don't know if Stefan or uh, Pramit would talk about it, uh, is the rise of populism in many parts of the world linked to this breaking apart of pro-globalization consensus in the West? And is there a new sort of like linkage between globalization in the East and populism? Pramit specifically, I think he's going to touch upon the findings from uh, Mint and Yoga Youth Surveys, the two rounds they did, and what is the big picture emerging from those surveys. So Stefan would start, and then uh, Pramit would follow uh, soon. Uh, one sort of like housekeeping question. So all conversations at CPR are very informal. If you have any clarifying question, please do stop the speaker and ask. But if you have big and very thought-provoking questions, I will request you to hold on till the speaker has finished, like both speakers have finished. Thank you. Stefan. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's a great pleasure to be here. I've heard about, uh, from my colleagues, the importance and uh, uh, high quality of uh, 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 of this institution in the life of India, uh, and uh, I'm very keen uh, that we develop a relationship. In fact, uh, I come under uh, some false pretenses of having insights about our data. I'm not an academic like you guys, but in order to get the most of our data, most from our data, we do in fact partner uh, with academic institutions uh, like yourselves. Uh, I realize you're a think tank, but uh, uh, think tanks and academic institutions, and indeed uh, the more thoughtful uh, media outlets. Uh, so we have uh, a very formal partnership with Cambridge University. There is a, a, the YouGov Center for um, Public Policy and Opinion Research at Cambridge University, which is inside the Polis Department uh, and is uh, uh, part of the Bennett Institute, uh, uh, or is also part of the Bennett Institute in Cambridge. Uh, we also uh, partner with Harvard and Stanford uh, on various projects, including a very large-scale uh, quarterly survey, uh, which goes back, tracking survey, which goes back now eight years in, into American politics. Um, we work with the EUI. We partner with them, the European University Institute in Florence, uh, for their annual um, State of the Union um, uh, uh, conference, uh, where we have a tracking, we've initiated a tracking study about social solidarity and other aspects of uh, cross-EU life. Um, we uh, uh, work as well with, uh, um, uh, with Mint, as you've heard, with uh, The Guardian, who's, who's the uh, partner to this project. The Times is our partner on political research in the UK, CBS News uh, in, uh, uh, in America. So we have a series of partnerships. Uh, and they really enrich what we do, not only in publicizing it and in analyzing it, but also helping us to shape the research. And what I very much hope to emerge from this uh, meeting and this discussion 
uh, is a relationship between us and you uh, that is a really constructive one. You will get all of the data in a format that you can look at it at, at, at very, in a very detailed way and play with the data uh, because there's a lot in it and a lot more than I uh, uh, can get out of it. Um, and this is a yearly study. Uh, we intend this to be a tracking study with very large sections of it repeating, but some changing. Uh, and for those changes, we welcome uh, any suggestions from you and are pleased to add uh, questions and uh, material that you might think relevant uh, to that that will make this something of really uh, great value. Uh, the uh, University of Sydney is also involved. The, uh, um, uh, we've been talking about this with... Uh, uh, the Institute of Policy Studies in Dubai, the more relationships we can create from the countries that are represented in this uh, study, the better for us. So I hope that a friendship will grow out of this. Uh, to tell you uh, a little bit about ourselves, YouGov is a market research company that uh, is a pioneer of, uh, I think it's fair to say, of, of um, uh, online research. We weren't the first to do online research. Um, lots of people like... Uh, well, some academics and also uh, Procter & Gamble and people like that were using it for quick and dirty research back in 1999. Uh, and when we came along, we decided that this was the best possible infrastructure for, or, or platform, if you like, for a new kind of research. That is to say, uh, a large-scale panel research. Uh, you, as academics, will be familiar with the value of panel uh, as opposed to one-off, um, talk-to-them-once surveys. Uh, but at the time, uh, uh, internet research was viewed as quick and dirty. Uh, it was not representative. Uh, it was never going to be high quality. It was just a quick way of getting some, 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 uh, some easy data. Well, we then at that time thought, no, we can be scientific about this. If we create a panel uh, and we recruit pe people to that panel, uh, then we can, uh, and we can engage them to stay with us over a large period of, long period of time, it would mean that we could create more and more data and get more and more richness out of uh, that data about individuals. And that is the state we're in now, that the people we survey have been, uh, most of them have been on the YouGov uh, panel for many years, which means we have developed uh, sometimes thousands, nearly always hundreds of uh, uh, variables of, uh, about their about their lives, uh, the key demographics, of course, but also what they read, what they eat, what they, what they think about uh, entertainment and social media and lots of, and lots of other things, as well as politics and consumer stuff and so forth. So it's a very powerful methodology, we believe, for, um, for really in-depth uh, in -depth research. Uh, you will be asking yourselves, well, how representative can online panels be? especially in a country like uh, India, where obviously a lot of people are not available. In fact, most people are not available uh, to online panels. Uh, back in 2000, when we started YouGov, and when uh, uh, at that time internet penetration in the UK was 30%, people thought you couldn't possibly do accurate polling uh, uh, on this panel that, that with 30% of people on, online. Uh, we argued then, uh, and we proved it to be the case, that so long as some of every demographic group are on the internet and we can recruit them to a panel, that's not a problem. Uh, yes, it was harder to find uh, older, poorer people at that uh, time uh, to, to come on, but they were not missing completely. And if they were not that different, if like for like demographics, but they happened to be online, then we could uh, spend more effort and spend more money bringing them onto the panel, and then we could, in fact, represent uh, uh, the, the, the nation perfectly. Uh, and the first polls we did, what was a big breakthrough, is we were accurate where the others were not accurate. We got elections by several percentage points closer than uh, any of the others, and that very quickly catapulted us in the UK into acceptability uh, uh, as uh, accurate researchers. Uh, there are different kinds of problems, obviously, with, with uh, the shape of uh, the population in a place like India, where you do have very out-of-the-way villages, large, large parts of the population are inaccessible to our methods. And I would not pretend that our uh, data for a lot of these countries, including India, is representative of the population. It clearly isn't. In fact, it's far off that. 
uh, and uh, there, when we know that something is not, uh, you know, cannot be, even with our methods, cannot be exactly representative, uh, we ask uh, you to view it in a different way. We say internet, uh, internet representative, which is a bit of a fig leaf, I do admit. It doesn't, it's not, very, not especially meaningful, but, but what you get from that is the segment of the population that is, on, that is online can be very well understood by our methods, and if that means there's a segment that isn't well understood, that doesn't mean you shouldn't get more understanding from the bit that you can understand. And then as the internet grows and smartphones and so on, we can, we can get to the rest. So we have to be careful about comparing like with like, and when we say, as, uh, as this data suggests to us, uh, that um, developing countries, uh, we say loosely here West and non-Western, but it's, it's really developing economies and non-developing, uh, or, or, uh, and, 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 and the rest, as it were, uh, in various stages. Uh, uh, when we say that they are more optimistic and more positive about globalization, it is, of course, the people living in the urban centers that are um, overrepresented in these, in these samples, uh, and, um, uh, and therefore uh, we have to be careful about those conclusions. However, uh, I can tell you in my limited way, uh, I'm not a data scientist, but I've looked at the, um, uh, the breaks within the data, uh, and if you compare similar levels of education within the sample across these groups, then the things, uh, that the, the broad uh, conclusions that we draw are borne out in a like-for-like -like comparison for the ones that we can compare. Uh, so very broadly, um, what the data shows in this area, and this is a very long survey, has lots of other stuff in it, but in the area that we're talking about, uh, is that the, um, uh, the Western countries, the, the, the developed countries, uh, are a lot more negative uh, about uh, globalization. Um, there is uh, much greater optimism uh, in the developing side, uh, in developing nations. Um, some specifics, uh, asking people about the uh, and we do explain what globalization is before we, before we ask these questions to people. We don't expect them to be thinking about globalism as a concept. In fact, I should say, the survey has a lot about where you'd go on holiday, whether you'd work in another country, what you think of different countries, whether you'd buy foreign goods compared to uh, you know, local goods, and so on. So we get people thinking about what the global economies are like and, and, and what that, that's about before we introduce the, the concept of globalism in there. Um, uh, but having done that, we then say, what do you think are the effects of globalization? Uh, on the in impact on the national economy in Saudi Arabia, 69% are positive uh, about it. In India, 63%. In China, 82%. Compare that with Germany at, 40, at 54%. The US, 45 Great Britain, 41%. And Japan at 22 Very different numbers. Uh, on the impact of local economies, Ex the same thing, India 55, Saudi 63, China 70, Indonesia 54, Thailand 54, much higher than uh, the 42, 38, 25, 20, etc. Uh, for um, Germany, US, GB, and Japan. On their impact of living standards, uh, it's the same story. On the impact of cult their cultural life, the same story, 74% uh, of People in China are positive about the effects of globalization on their cultural life uh, compared to 38% uh, in the US, 39% in the GB, and so forth. Uh, uh, only in the areas of crime uh, is, there, uh, uh, is there some change in that, 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 that nobody is, uh, uh, well, everybody has some concerns about the impact uh, of uh, uh, on crime of um, immigration, of course, and, 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 and that I think is uh, um, uh, the one piece that, is, that, that looks differently here. Optimism about their own future. India is very optimistic about itself. 78% of uh, people think it's getting better. Uh, Indonesia, 76. Thailand, 75. Compare that to Japan at 26% and the GB at 44%, Germany, 41%. Uh, and so on. Uh, so much more optimism there about the future of their own country as well. Uh, uh, future, uh, about the future of the world. India, 70% positive about the world getting better. Germany, a really low 13%. Uh, and this is uh, uh, that's very miserable. Uh, and uh, Britain, hardly better at 16%. 
satisfaction with the medical care getting better. And we're asking people to compare, uh, and this, of course, is a slightly different uh, topic now, uh, but we've asked people to uh, talk about whether their access to medical care, travel, and all sorts of other things are getting better or worse. Um, uh, China, 63%, India, 56%, and so forth. And again, US and GB at 16 and 15% um, in terms of uh, uh, whether these are getting better. So uh, optimism across, um, the, uh, uh, across um, uh, uh, the developing countries, uh, pessimism in, uh, in the West. Uh, we also asked uh, about um, different types of government. Uh, uh, we had a particular question, do you think it's better for the economy? Uh, sorry, do you th what do you think is more important, uh, a good democracy or a strong economy? Um, in the West, uh, obviously, uh, you'd expect um, uh, a higher rating for good democracy uh, compared to uh, uh, other countries um, where um, uh, there is a much more mixed uh, picture. Um, it's, 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 uh, um, I'm going to find it in a second, I've got it here somewhere. Uh, uh, I will come back to that. I will, I will return to that. I can't, I can't see that number right now. Uh, when we asked um, which kind of system of government would work best, uh, direct democracy, parliamentary democracy, um, uh, neither uh, uh, non-democratic forms, uh, very few people ticked uh, non-democratic demographic, non-democratic uh, non, non uh, forms of government, uh, but um, there's a, a very high level of don't knows uh, amongst uh, across all of these, including in the West, which suggests to me a lack of confidence uh, in the West now in their own democratic institutions. That is uh, the broad um, uh, picture that emerges from this. Um, there's obviously a lot more in it, uh, but I was keeping my remarks fairly short. I look forward to the discussion afterwards where I hope we can uh, uh, delve into some of these things and perhaps also issues around methodology and so forth, um, but I'll leave it for now. For now. Thank, you. thank you. So, uh, Rahul, thank you very much for inviting me here. So, uh, as Rahul already uh, said earlier, we had done two rounds of uh, this U-Government uh, Millennial Survey. Uh, it was an online survey, and uh, the first round essentially focused on trying to figure out what young people online, uh, what are the sort of consumption habits, what are the kind of social media platforms they use, uh, and how they differ from the older cohorts. Uh, the second round, uh, the first round was this, uh, last year, somewhere in July. The second round uh, was in Jan, Feb, uh, ahead of the Lok Sabha elections, and that featured many more questions on uh, political ideology as well as social values, beliefs, and we wanted to see how sort of they mapped onto each other. So I'll be talking more about the uh, second round because this was recent and as well as ties into what uh, sort of Stephen was talking about support for uh, globalization, whether that has actually translated into liberal norms, so I'll try and answer that question. Although there, there were no questions specifically about globalization in our sort of study. So uh, just to sort of uh, briefly uh, talk about, I've already sort of gone through the, and they were from Yuga of India's panel uh, spread across roughly 180, uh, 180 cities and towns. Uh, so this is an urban sort of uh, thing and online. Uh, so uh, as uh, Stephen also pointed out, nowhere are we claiming to be representative of uh, India. Uh, I mean, the latest TRI data shows that uh, your internet subscriber to population ratio is somewhere around 90% in, 98% in urban India, 25% in rural India. So. Rural India almost is completely out of this. Uh, in urban India, we think uh, it's a sort of good coverage, and we had respondents across income groups. I mean, that's what the data showed, so there was uh, sort of uh, uh, good coverage for that. So I'll start with some of the uh, key findings when it comes to the uh, consumption habits or the online habits of youngsters. Uh, 
So one of the striking findings was uh, uh, the TV news in India. Uh, although, you know, uh, we always talk about shrieking anchors and what should be done about them. The fact is that they're already losing market share. And uh, it is digital outlets. Uh, and some of these, uh, I suspect, uh, are also uh, news websites promoted by legacy media organizations. And I'm not uh, saying this because I work in one, but I've seen some data on this, which is sort of proprietary data that we can't share, but which suggests that many of this go to traditional sort of media houses. The Times Group uh, is a big, of course, uh, but it's also Andhavada Patrika, HT's overall this thing, and so on. Then So it's both uh, vernacular and uh, uh, English. Uh, but digital is gaining ground rapidly. And if you look at uh, the uh, younger millennials, uh, 22 to 28, and the Gen Z, uh, their viewing patterns is the reverse of the Gen X uh, when it comes to TV news versus news from internet uh, websites and apps. They also obviously spend uh, much more time on social media, the younger ones compared to the older ones. Uh, and uh, Facebook uh, is less popular among the youngest compared to the uh, compared to Instagram, and uh, you find a sort of uh, linear progression towards Insta as you move to younger cohorts. Uh, and uh, this is this uh, this actually. It is not. It doesn't have much to do with privacy concerns because we all were also asked about those questions, and there the young and the old uh, responses didn't seem to be starkly different. So it was just that their uh, familiarity or their uh, the like. I mean, their uh, consumption habits was such that they preferred this new sort of medium compared to the older ones. So active social life, but not so active uh, outdoor life. Uh, which is why I think we now have a Fit India uh, program. Uh, so w w the broad picture, and these are all from the first round that we had from the first round, was there were s the young uh, part of the economy, and they're a sizable bit, you know, half of adults. Uh, they are driving the trends in the consumer economy, at least. Uh, and in different ways compared to the older co cohorts, part of it driven by technology. But when it, come to, when it comes to the political arena and the social values and beliefs, we found that uh, that uh, easy divide between young and the old does not actually exist. The story is far more complicated. Uh, so this was uh, the question about the support for the party which they feel most aligned with. And this was even before the Balakot strike. So uh, nothing to do with that. And you see, I mean, almost 50% uh, vote share across age groups. Uh, and which would be roughly similar to BJP's contested vote share, uh, if we just look at constituencies where they have contested. Uh, so, and that also gave us confidence in the other findings uh, later on. I mean, we published this before the results, but. Uh, so even the concerns were uh, sort of, uh, so we tried to uh, ask various questions, and later when we analyzed, tried to see what was the difference between the BJP supporter and the rest uh, among the youth and among others. So among both youth and others, there was not much difference when it came to issues. They were both concerned about jobs. They were concerned about corruption, safety of women, and so on. And uh, one hypothesis that sort of could explain this, and I would, uh, I mean, this is an open hypothesis. You can disagree and come up with others as well is perhaps that the, it is not that they uh, were not worried about jobs uh, or they felt that everything was going fine in the economy and hence voted uh, the BJP back to power. It was perhaps that uh, they didn't expect any radical or different kind of solution from the other parties, perhaps. So there was a credibility problem, perhaps, which uh, led to them supporting this party, uh, even though they had... Uh, Many of them had concerns with uh, the economic agenda. This was a bit surprising uh, for me, and uh, 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 even though not entirely unexpected, 
that there's very little support for uh, a liberal libertarian approach in governance when it comes to the economy. Uh, most youngsters, uh, uh, very few youngsters feel that the government should not be in the business of uh, business. You know, and this is a, this is a statement that uh, the Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi had made once, although not in recent memory, uh, that the the government has no business to be in business. This is a typical uh, sort of uh, uh, standard axiom of uh, liberal economics uh, and uh, right wing. I, by right wing, I mean economically right wing politics. Uh, but you find greater support for that axiom among the older ones. Uh, rather than among the younger ones. And uh, the support for an active state that actually creates jobs, and we also had given an option, option that governments should enable jobs rather than create uh, more government jobs. The support for that was lesser than governments creating jobs themselves. So uh, that tells you that you know uh, one way of looking at it is that there is also uh, uh, liberalization has benefited uh, a lot of people, but it, it may not have uh, benefited everyone equally and the expecta expectations in terms of the kind of uh, job benefits, wage benefits, salary benefits that people had may have been coming down, especially in the post-crisis era. I mean, we need further research on this. There's not enough within this survey to sort of this thing. But yes, there is a support for an activist state and it runs deep. On social issues, actually, there is uh, a mixed sort of evidence on what BJP supporters versus others want. And uh, in general, the youth are more uh, liberal or uh, support uh, liberal values more compared to the old. And within them, there is not much difference between those who support the BJP and uh, uh, those who support other parties, at least on issues related to intercaste and interreligious marriages. On gender, there is a slight difference, uh, but not much. Uh, the divide really is in food and drinks. So BJP supporters have a problem with meat, an even bigger problem with beef, and with alcohol. So they, th those were the striking sort of uh, differences that we found. Al almost everything else, you couldn't really say that this guy the BJP supporter, this guy is not. I mean, on most social issues, uh, they're similar. Uh, oh, by the way, we didn't have uh, uh, Congress separately because the Congress sample was so small that it, uh, I mean, statistically, it didn't make sense to have it separately. Uh, but uh, when it comes to support for BJP, there is a divide uh, when, uh, between the Hindus and non-Hindus. So that reflects, uh, this is among youth, and it's among the old, and there's uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, this divide exists uh, as much among the youth among, as among uh, the older cohorts. The youth are liberal on things like uh, uh, homosexuality, for instance. Uh, the younger, youngest cohort is the most liberal, followed by younger millennials, followed by older millennials, and Gen X is much lower uh, in terms of acceptance of homosexuality. And similar, we asked questions about premarital sex, and the broad trends are sort of similar. Uh, and even when we did a BJP, non-BJP sort of split of this, there is not much difference. So there's enough gay rights supporter within the BJP crowd as well. But it is religiosity that we found that has a bigger uh, and more profound influence on attitude towards uh, uh, gay rights, as well as other things, uh, uh, including uh, gender rights, uh, rights of women. Uh, uh, so which led us to this question that whether in India religiosity is actually a greater divide uh, compared to political affiliation. And this, this cuts across religious Hindus, religious Muslims, religious Sikhs, Christians. Everyone. So uh, regardless of which religion you follow, if you, if you say that religion is very important to you in your life, you are likely to have uh, uh, much more sort of uh, equal view of women, much more uh, unequal view of uh, gay rights, and so on. Uh, and uh, it's not the opium of the masses. Uh, it, it cuts across income classes. Uh, so at least in India, uh, 
that doesn't uh, really hold uh, yeah so that's that's about it from my end i mean these are all taken from uh, uh, reports that we have already published uh, so, so the broad uh, this thing is what i think uh, this is what we arrived at uh, uh, sort of looking at all of the information together that, yes, in terms of technological sort of means of communication, in terms of consumption choices, the youth are very different. But when it comes to political beliefs, political ideologies, uh, and social values, uh, maybe they're not uh, that different. Although they, uh, the very young are uh, less religious compared to, say, older millennials and Gen X, that may be a rite of passage, you know. Uh, when you're 18 to 22 and uh, you know you are at a certain age but in general within youth we find that uh, you know religion is a big driver of uh, the views and belief systems thank you Great.